I totally feel, you've heard me say over and over again, I am a textual type message type of guy. I guess I feel my safest in that wheelhouse. A textual message is you find a text, mainly in New Testament, and you break it down into word phrases, allowing it to create its own uh, outline of the message. The Old Testament isn't quite that easy. The Old Testaments are more stories. And I, like a lot of preachers, they're able to take the story and say stuff in it. Uh, sometimes I think preachers are stretching what it's saying and all that type of stuff. So uh, I'm going to be ministering a passage out of the Old Testament that I felt like the Holy Spirit led, and it kind of goes along with a little bit of the... Uh, uh, of the song that was sung. I'll start in the book of Revelation, then I'll move on into the Old Testament. But it's kind of, it's awkward for me because it's not my style. That's not my style. Yeah, for those just sitting out there, you normally got what you call a textual message. Uh, textual message, you got expositorial type messages, different preachers, and then you have topical messages. That's just a little bit of information. Topical message is okay if I want to teach on love. I pretty well go and find all the passages on love, and I minister on love. A textual message is where you take a passage of Scripture out of the New Testament, and you allow it. See, back kids... All them diagram sentences y'all learned when y'all was are learning while you're in school that I thought was complete ignorant. When I got to college, I had to diagram the whole New Testament, breaking it down into word phrases. And that will help you as you're studying. So that's what we call a textual message. And then an expositorial message is where you uh, bloviate or talk about what's going on in that passage. And, and that's kind of where I'm headed to. And I don't like getting in those type of things, but when the Lord lays something on your heart to share, and again, I, I, I started putting stuff on Facebook Monday and Tuesday, heading in, in this direction. So, pray that you're blessed. I, I don't want to come across hard, but I do want to come across truthful what the Scripture says. Amen. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, starting at verse 14. And the angel of the Lord of the church of Lacedonia, Les Laodiceans, I know I've pronounced that a thousand times in my life, these things say the amen, faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Let it be a light to our feet and unto our path. Let us have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lacedonian church... If again, theologically, if you study it, you got the seven churches that he talks about in the book of Revelation. And it's seven physical churches that were there during the time of the disciples, seven physical lo location church of Sardis, church of Philadelphia. All of these different churches were physical churches at the time. Theologians believe that it's also a time period. The, the first church was a church that was persecuted, so that particular church, and it works us all the way down, that each one of those church represents a time or an age in history that the church was going through certain things. And this particular passage here, the church of Laodicea, Laodicea was, is what we call the last church or the church that's, living in our present time and I really do believe that the key to this passage here look what he's telling us here I know that you're physically rich and I believe we're living in that time you just think about your lives personally you, you got beautiful homes you drive beautiful cars everything is great here and that's what he's saying you got everything together but when it comes to spiritual matters you're lukewarm 
Physically, you got it together. I mean, uh, you got more money than you ever have, and young people that go to this church, mainly young Christians, you know what God has done for you. Most of you come here, you didn't have nothing, you know what I'm saying? And God has taken you, and God has blessed you, and God has done all these things. But God said, the one thing I have against you is this right here. You got physically, you got it all together, but your problem is when it comes to spiritual things, you're lukewarm. The word lukewarm is where we get the word neutral. In other words, you're just standing in place. You're not doing nothing. He said, look, I wish you were either cold or hot. Your problem is that you're just living in neutral. You're not doing anything. You're not doing anything against God, but you're not doing anything for God. You become, fil you become filthy rich in a sense. You got everything you possibly need, but when it comes to doing things for the kingdom of God, you're doing absolutely nothing because, be honest with you, you're too busy trying to live up to what the world around us says going on. We are spiritually bankrupt, and that's what is going on living in neutral. I want you to know something right here. As we enter into the next passage of Scripture, we're, we're God is always, listen to me, God is always attracted to neediness. Jesus was always attracted to people that were in need. People that don't feel like they have any need, that they're blessed, they got it all together. God is repulsed to those type of people because it is a self-righteousness that they have on their own, not even having enough sense that God blesses us to be a blessing and somehow we get wrapped up into things and get ourselves in big trouble. And look at this passage of scripture for all us self-righteous people that sit in the church. Luke chapter 18, verses 19 through 14. He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their, moral, over their moral performance and looked down their noses at common people. Thank God for common people. Two men went up to the temple, he says, to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this. <laughs> Oh God, I thank you that I am not like all the other people. Robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven bid like this tax man over here praying. Now, I could go back and add some more stuff, you know what I'm saying, to really get folks stirred up, but I'm not interested in getting you stirred up here this morning, okay? Uh, look at it, he says, I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. Sounds good, don't it? Like, that's what most churches would love to have this type of person go into their church, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? Meanwhile, the tax man slumped over in the shadows. His face is in, hand, in, his, his, in his hands, not daring to look up and said, God, give mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. And Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you are content to be simply yourself, you will come more than yourself. Look what the passage here is saying. To the self-righteous people, and the church has become majorly self-righteous in its time. Listen to me. When we think we got it all together because we can go buy what we want to buy, and we can live in our house that we want to live, and if we want to go out and eat, we, we can do that, there's always going to be a danger when you right, arrive into that situation. That's what he told the, the children of Israel. He brought them out of the land of Egypt and said, look, I'm fixing to carry you into Canaan land or the good land. He said, I just want you to be careful, though. There's something going to happen to you. When you begin to be blessed and when you begin to live in houses you didn't even have to build and you have all this, just remember it was God that gave you the power to have wealth and you not yourself. And that is what God, I think, is trying to say to us as a church and what, we, what he would say to society. We got it all together. Everything looks good, but there's a danger when you're living in that type of life. Not that God don't want that for us, but there's a danger when we begin to live that type of life because somehow we begin to think we don't need God because the blessings are proof that God is on my side. And there's a danger when we get in that particular situation. 
When I got ready, to the passage that I'm fixing to speak on is 2 Kings chapter 4, 1 through 7. When I was beginning to think about it, it says the key with the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you could do all kinds of things. The title I got for it is What's in your house, Our House. But you could say what's in your house. You could say a miracle in your house. You can say no empty vessels in your house. You can say you need to fill the vessels with oil. I mean, I mean, this one particular passage of scripture, you could go a thousand different directions, but I'm gonna try my best to go in the direction I feel like the Lord wants us to go in. Are we are we a little loud? Okay, I seem like I'm getting some echo. Okay, we're good. All right, just maybe since I've lost all this weight, maybe my ears ain't as fat. So. <laughs> Maybe since I've been eating all this broccoli, I can hear, you know. <laughs> Eat some more carrots, and I may not need my glasses, you know, and that type of stuff. All right, 2 Kings chapter 4. A certain woman of the wives of the son of, of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Let me just stop there. It was... It was common, it was actually legally okay that if you had a certain amount of debt and you couldn't pay it, they could take your children and your son, the creditors could take them as a bondservant until uh, you could get everything paid off or until the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, there was a year of Jubilee. At, at that point in time, everybody was set free, okay? So that, really that word slave there should be a bondservant. You become a bondservant to whatever uh, they needed, okay? So Elijah said unto her, what shall I do for you? Now, let's let me stop here. Notice she does not answer this question. She answers, she goes to the next thing, uh, does, but she doesn't answer this question. You see that? Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? And she doesn't answer. Let me give you a little bit of advice. The more and more I'm learning. Sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut when people are asking you questions. Your opinion is not always needed because your very opinion might be something that comes back and bites you in the butt. All right, so let's keep on going. What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maid ser servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour into all of those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass that when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons shall uh, live on the rest. There's a few, few questions that you, we need to look at here and few statements that we need to look at here and see how it can uh, relate to me. Relate to us as a church. How can it relate to me as an individual? How can it relate to me as my family? And we'll do that. So that's what I want. When I'm ministering a message, I hope it like a buckshot. I hope it scatters and hits every one of us. I hope as I'm shooting it off, it hits that wall and bounces back and hits me. You always want to come to the house of God and be able to let there's some iron sharpening iron in our life. And the first thing he asks is the widow lady. They, most commentaries believe that this might have been Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah's wife, okay, was a servant to Elijah. The first thing or the next thing he asked her, asked her after asking what can I do for you is what's in your house? Remember this, this is the most important question that you can have sent to you or that we can answer here. What you have in your house is what's most important. She had a need and the answer was right in her house, right in front of her the whole time. A lot of the situation that you face in life or we face in the church of life, we're wanting to get somebody to get our creditors. We're wanting somebody to go help us out. We're wanting somebody to give us a million dollars. And what God is saying to us here is, 
Everything you need to be blessed, everything you need to set yourself up for a miracle is sitting right in your house to be able to bless you. And the problem is so many of us don't see what's going on within our house. A lot of us don't see what's going on in our, in our particular situations. See, many times we want God to do something for us, but God wants us to use what we already have to get us out of this situation. And let me speak first of all to the church. A lot of times we got a lot of situations that go on, a lot of problems that go on. The only way that we can answer the situation that are going on in the church and that will face the church is when the people in the church begin to rise up and be used by God. When they will begin to take their gifts and they begin to take their callings and be willing to step out and be used within the church. We don't need any outside sources. We need what's in the, in the house of God, in the church of God. And listen right here. If we do not use what we have, she had a jar of oil. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If we do not use what we have, it will dry up. Remember the parable of the talents? One was given five, one was given three, and one was given one. The one with five used it and got ten back. Don't, excuse me. Yeah, he got ten back. One got three, doubled his. The one with one did not use his talents. He said, you're, I, you're a fearful, I, I fear you. You're a hard taskmaster. You don't sow, but you reap back. See, a lot of us have gifts and callings sitting in the church. And this church is in need. And we have gifts and callings and everything we need is sitting right here with us. And a lot of us don't step out and allow ourselves to be used. And as a result, we're living in poverty just like she was living in poverty. Now hang on with me now. We're going to go somewhere. Listen to me. She said, and what, notice, what do you have in your house? And look what she said. Ah, nothing but a jar of oil. The jar of oil was the most important thing she had. See, the jar of oil in her mind was nothing but a jar they were going to use for her death. When they died back then, they wrapped themselves in these frankincense and oil, and that's what they kept themselves from stinking. She was saving. The only, only thing she had left in her house was something that was prepared for death. Y'all follow me here. Prepared for death. Listen to me. When the oil runs out in the church, there's a big issue that's going to go on. There are churches dying all around us. Buildings closed up. Churches all over the United States are closing their door. You know why? They're no longer bringing in empty vessels for God to fill up. They're self-righteous, don't need nobody. They ain't willing to work with people. In fact, here, let me give you $10 for the youth group and you handle the youth. Here, let me give you $10 to take care of the children and you handle the children. And here, I'll give you $20 for missionaries to send overseas to make ourselves feel better not realizing that God wants to use us in this area and God wants to use us in the church see she did not value what she had nothing but a jar of oil see the oil represents the work and anointing of the Holy Spirit See, all represents the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. And then sitting right now in the body of Christ, God has anointed you. The scripture said, God, the anointing abides upon you. And the Bible says the anointing of God was on Jesus, on Jesus for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. So the anointing of God is on you, lives in you, abides on you, and it's for the purpose of destroying the works of the enemy that would want to come upon us. But we in the church today do not value the anointing and we do not value the power of the Holy Spirit. You know why? We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We got a Tylenol if my head hurts. We don't even have to pray about it. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit because we got a nice church, we got a nice building, we got a nice praise and worship team. They are bringing on and we don't value the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God is for you individually and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God for you individually is to destroy the works of the enemy and our problem is we do not value it. Oh, we don't have nothing but a jar of oil. 
And see, and some of you are seeking out all the good things in this old world, and I'm all for it, have it nice, but you're forgetting the very thing that God has brought you and set you into this earth. We become blind. We become physically rich, but you're spiritually bankrupt. Ephesians 5.17 says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dis dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there means be being filled. In other words, as I give out, God is going to pour in. That jar sitting over in the corner that's prepared for nothing but death if it's not being poured out, it can't be used. And that's what's going on with a lot of people sitting in the church today. Y'all hear me? A lot of people sitting in church, you're just preparing for death. You're not pouring out into other people's lives. And you wonder why things are dying around you. And look what he says. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. The very next passage talks about wives submit to their husbands and their husbands lo uh, loving their wives. Look at me. It, to, to, to have a marriage that's going to work, it is going to take a Spirit-filled living. Too many of us live on our marriage and do things and just go on with because everything looks good. We got nice homes, nice cars, everything looks good. But listen to you. Me and, me and that woman been married over 33 years and I'll tell you what it takes work it takes the Holy Spirit and me and her both to even like each other some days and it's the truth of the matter it ain't a matter of falling in love or out of love I don't have that I don't have that benefit it ain't a benefit, but I don't I just go, uh-uh. Listen to me. It takes the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God to live within us and work in us and through of us. Recognize it ain't about what kind of home we got, what type of car we got. It's are we spilling out? Are we touching people's lives? We don't have time to be mad at each other because we're busy ministering to people. See, the oil is inexhaustible, but must be poured out to be refilled. And see, some of you just got your little oil, you got your little oil bottle, and you're not doing nothing with it. And this is what he says. You're not, he's not, feel, he can't fill in if some of the water ain't gone. And you know what's really sad, and I ain't saying this because you just did that, but y'all are more worried about that. Y'all are more worried about the floor than the people sitting in the congregation. This building is nothing but a shell. The people that's coming in this church is more important than what this building looks like. And when we begin to recognize the people that God's sending into this building here is the people that I should be pouring my life into, then I can, God can pour his life into me. And it's a continued transition of the Holy Spirit of God living with me. Our problem, again, I'll say it again, we got some oil over there. All, that's all I got is oil. And don't even value the very thing that's going to be life. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's God using you and flowing through you. The next thing what God says, okay, just got one oil, but look what he says. Borrow vessels, vessel, verse 3 says, then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather a few. Look what he says there. You only got a little bit of oil here? I want you to go get some vessels. But he says, don't just get a few of them, get a bunch of them. And look what he says, get empty vessels. The day the church stops dealing with empty vessels is the day that the oil will dry up. The reason why Hosanna has been as faithful as it is through the pandemic and the reason why he's been able to keep going when all other churches are getting mad at each other and shutting down, the reason is, is we've been dealing with empty vessels. We deal with people that are hurting. We deal with people that have a need for God. And God is attracted to needy people. God is attracted to people who know that they need God every day. And when we have that mentality, instead of having our nose stuck up, you say, well, I ain't got my nose stuck. You sure look like it. Oh, 
See, it's not so much what you think, it's what other people see in you. What do people see in you? It takes emptiness for an outpouring to occur. Uh, occur. Y'all get that? It takes for broken vessels to come in this place for God's anointing and God's supply to come in. Problem is, we don't want to deal with those type of people. Yeah, I love my Celebrate Recovery group. I do. Some of you couldn't handle it because you're self-righteous. You're the very anointing that God's called you to have to be able to work with people. You're saving in a corner till you die and everything around you is dying. You can't even recognize it. Things are dying all around you and you can't even see it. That's why in the book of Revelation he said you're blind. A blind person can't see that, he's, that there's an issue going on. To the point that we build big homes, have big cars, and we can't, don't have time to build, deal with empty, broken people. I'm too busy trying to pay for everything I got. And young people, you fell for it. Don't fall for it. See, the church is already full of people that need nothing. You get that? The church is full of people who need nothing. Uh, Y'all ain't getting that. The church is full of people who need nothing. We need to stop pouring into full vessels. You hear me? We're pouring into each other. What happens to a pond or a lake that does nothing but receive and never gives out? It gets stagnant. It dies, it dries up. Nothing can live within it. We get around each other and we want to pray for you and you pray for me and I'm having problems and we're having problems and I'm going to hang around all the other people that we have problems together with and birds of the feather begin to flock together and, and, you know, and then we look down on those people because they don't sin like we does. I'm thug over here, but we don't like how they thug over there. And before it's over with, we get a little self-righteous and we begin to think we have need of nothing because we ain't quite as bad as they are. They are not the comparison. And it's as long as we're bringing in people that are broken, God says, I will keep pouring it out. I'll provide money for the church. I'll do whatever it takes. You know what? Now, 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 get up, now, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Some of the very ones that are clapping and having a good time with me right now may be the ones that ain't pouring into nothing. See, it's easy. And I'm not trying to be hard, but it's easy. Hear me? It's easy to say amen to something. It's harder to put up with people. You know it is. Right? See, because we just ain't truthful with people. I'll look at them and say, man, how long are you going to tell me that story? I love you, but it's time to move on, bro. Darling, it's time for you to build a bridge and get over it. We need to teach people how to pour out what they have. You know why I love teaching these different classes? It keeps me on the edge. It lets me know what's really going on out in the world. It lets me know what common people are really dealing with. I don't mind being a common people. Lord spoke to me years ago and said, I just want you to be an ordinary. He used the word ordinary, and that's how come I don't wear suits or ties or nothing. I ain't against them. But you know what? Ordinary. We ought to be ordinary. Get around ordinary people to be able to minister to them. Imagine that. The anointing stopped when she stopped. What, what if they would have kept collecting vessels? 
But the oil, notice, I'm using the word wrong, stop, it ceased. That means it still had supply, it just ceased. Stop means it ran out. And now it wouldn't have never, it should have kept having empty vessels. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and the oil of the Holy Spirit will keep filling all the different vessels up. So it, did, it wasn't like it stopped. She stopped bringing in empty vessels. And churches, listen to me, churches that are not helping and not dealing with broken people are drying up all around us. Some of your local churches in this particular area are griping because some of them are still wanting to have Sunday school, but the others not wanting to have Sunday school because of the COVID. And they're drying up and they're quitting. And I'm not mad at them, but that's kind of what happens when you stop bringing in all uh, broken vessels. Broken vessels, like I don't care if I got going to get COVID or not, I got to get to the house of God because I got some issues I, I got to deal with. And I hope when they get there, we got some folks who can pour into them. The problem is, is when they get there, nobody will pour into them. That's the dangerous problem. The dangerous problem when an empty vessel comes and we have nobody to talk to them. You know why? You used to people pouring into us all the time. Look what it says here. And when you come in, he's talking to the, the, uh, the, the prophet's wife, widow. When you come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went in, shut the door behind her and the sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Sometimes in life when you begin to pour, you just got to short, shut the door on the naysayers. Jesus did. Remember when he walked into the, the, the little girl's house? He put all the unbelievers outside and shut the door. Elijah walked in to pray for somebody, shut the door. Sometimes in life when you want to do something as crazy as building a million dollar facility down there in the midst of a pandemic, sometimes you just better shut the door behind you because there'll be a bunch of people telling you can't do it. They just don't realize we got a bunch of ordinary people that believe in the kingdom of God and can do it. That's about the craziest thing going. You know what the craziest thing is too? We're up $100,000 this year over than what we were last year in the midst of a pandemic. We're a third of the class, a third of the people coming to the church. What would happen if we would begin to pour into broken people and be patient with broken men? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love are all, I mean, that's what you got to do with people because people will rob you of everything you got, and you got to be patient with them, and you got to love people. That that ain't mean you're agreeing with what they're doing. That mean I'm going to set myself aside and love these people. They're broken people. And pray God help me to say the right thing to be able to see them transformed in life. I guess this is what Brother Damon is trying to tell you, young people. Go out and be blessed. Amen. Go get all your education. Go be blessed. Build you nice homes. Have nice cars. But always make sure you got some set aside, some finances, and some time to put into people's lives. Because if you don't, one day it'll cease. It'll come to an end. And you'll step back and say, what happened? Problem is you become blind. Too busy complaining. See, once you become a person who complains, all you complain about everything. You complain about your children. You complain about your husband. You complain about your job. You complain about everything instead of recognize the blessing you have. Listen to me. What we have will increase best, listen to me, in our hands, not somebody else's hands. She went and she began to fill the vessels. 
Not the sons. They was just brought the empty vessels in. She began to fill them up. She didn't even know that she was about to run out. She is too busy filling. See, what's in your house, what's in your hands, prepares you for the miracle you need in life. What you have, your talents, your gifts, your calling will prepare you for the next miracle. She needed a miracle, and guess what? She got it. In let, me, let me say this. Elijah didn't go to the debtor and say, you cruel debtor. You don't make her pay for anything. No, God provided a miracle where she could be blessed and the debtors could be blessed. And I jumped ahead of myself, but the next point was this. Verse 6 says, Now it came to pass that when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is no other, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Is that not sad? Uh, <laughs> Woo, Lord, have mercy on us if we look in the oil ceases and stops. It, it reminded me of Samson. Remember when Samson, he would shake himself and break the vines and stuff that they... But the scripture said that when he finally got deceived, he shook himself as before and wished, wished that the Holy Spirit had not departed. Oh, my Lord. What will happen to us as a church if we worship and we praise and we play the drums and we sing and then we look around one day and the oil has dried up. There's no more nobody around for us to pour into. What we will begin to do is pour into each other and sooner or later they will implode on each other. And when the, when the vessels ran out, the oil ceased. Do you understand that about yourself? Us as a church, but do you understand that about yourself? The day you stop pouring into people, the day it's going to cease up. There's, do you understand that? You understand that, young people? Because if we don't, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. You understand that? Let, let me, let me, I'm, I'm going to get just kind of personal here. We've had some crazy things go on in the years around here, mainly with the worship teams. Because let me tell you what, if you attend Hosanna Family Worship Center, you are not overworked. In the past, we showed up an hour before church service for worship practice. The worship team showed up an hour before that to pray. And we did that on Sunday mornings. We did that on Wednesdays. And we did that on uh, Sunday nights. Then we had an extra praise and worship practice, okay? At Hosanna, you got basically Sunday morning, and you have Wednesday night maybe, and some of you don't do that because we have different people, or, uh, uh, or praise and worship practice. So that leaves you five other days of the week. The problem with the five other days of the week, we spend it trying to pay for everything we bought and hassled around with, so we don't have time to pour into anybody else. And our wives and everybody get mad at us and go out and do crazy things, all because we stop pouring into people because we're trying to pay for everything it takes to live the other five days a week. Everybody say, oh, me. Yes. If you want to say something, come here. So I know this message, it's the whole time you've been sitting here talking about it. I've been 
thinking about the empty vessels. And he told them, he said, go get these, go get vessels from your neighbors. Go borrow these vessels. And then... Borrow just means ask. Yeah, just borrow them. But he didn't say that there wasn't something in these vessels that had to be cleaned out first. He didn't say that there might not have been something. He said, just bring me empty vessels. Empty vessels. They may have had to empty some stuff out of these vessels before they brought them. And I say that because the whole time that you've been ministering, the thought inside of me is, in Revelation it says that we're blind and we're lukewarm. There's things on the inside of us that we've allowed that we think are are good and we don't we're blind to our sin, the things that we allow to get on the inside of our vessels. And I can tell you personally that there's some things that the Lord has showed me within the last few weeks that I allowed on the inside of my vessel that have to be emptied out before that oil can flow out of me. And what I'm saying is, if we stop bringing our empty vessel to the Lord, He'll stop pouring out the oil that is needed for this area. We've got to allow Him to empty the things in us out that are not are crowding out the ability for a vessel to be filled with his anointing and we have to repent and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be anyway and I know the Lord loves us no matter what but if you want to be used to the Lord and you want to see things happening in your life and that I'm saying it first hand because the Lord showed me things in my own life that needed to be emptied out and we got to bring our empty vessel to the Lord. I agree. So this is personally, this is church. I'm a pastor, so I'm looking at the church. You know what you need individually. You know, church, and hey, look at me. I ain't going to be mad at you either way. I'd Like I told you. But I, my eyes and God's eyes is always drawn to needy people. Look at Jesus in the Bible. He's He's looking for somebody. Everybody he approached had need. Last one. Notice he wasn't outraged at the debtor, but provided a miracle to pay the debt. We need to be stopped being mad at people and say, God, I need a miracle here in my life and in my house. Because you know what? It's in your house. We need to stop asking God to do something and start saying, God, do something in me first. Right? Right? (laughs) And I could start pulling some things out. I don't want to because there's some sensitive situations here. But we got to stop and recognize what God may have a need in our lives and prepare ourselves quickly to begin to pour out and to reach other people. The anointing is there. Whether it's flowing through you or not, the anointing of God's there. He said, you have an anointing. He said, the anointing abides on you. It abides on you to work through you. Well, our problem is, do we stick our nose up because we, we're doing pretty good? Got me a nice car. Look at my nice car. We forget the hoopty when it was first given to us. Hmm? Remember that type of stuff? Now we got cars that will massage our butt. <laughs> blow air conditioning up the rear end if you need it. Well, Lord, I don't know what all that's about, but it's there. Steering wheel gets so hot, you got to take your hands off of it. Some of us forget the Chevy Vega, 74 Chevy Vega. 
that had an eight-track Sparkomatic tape in it. Some, some of us forget about that kind of stuff. We're so happy with what we're driving now, we forget about what we first had. Huh? Me and Brandy first got married. This is God-awful truth. We took the patio furniture that the dogs had slept on. We took it, loaded everything we had, went to Bible college because we were on fire for the kingdom of God. Glory to God. We had both just gotten saved. We wrapped sheets around it, moved into that house. Lord know how we paid for it. She got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and worked a prayer line for a worldwide ministry, praying for over 80 people. She had never prayed for nobody in her life. She just got saved. Now she's praying for people from New York City all over the place. I'm working at a crazy umbrella yogurt shop. <laughs> All my friends were at LSU, and here I am with a yogurt hat on top of my head saying, Welcome to Umbrella's Yogurt. Can I help you? I would get 15 cents if I could talk them into putting sprinkles on top of their ice cream. Would you like some sprinkles? Hey, and then I was on, they'd have birthday parties at this place, and they would want me to go in and tell them stories birthday stories my lord I didn't even hardly study in school you know what I'm saying so here I did that it was humiliating old friends that I had coming in from LSU seeing me with a yogurt hat on but you know what it really didn't matter because God had gotten a hold of my heart uh, he had gotten a hold of my heart so the popularity thing didn't matter to me no more and guess what 30 years later here I am now they're calling me they're talking to me about things and issues in life. We're in it for the long run. We minister to people. We reach out to people. We love people. Go get your education. Go live in nice things. But Lord, let's don't be satisfied, but just a jar preparing you for death. Amen.